Also, online. HPG connection, online. Educational module, online. All systems, nominal. Hello, everybody, and welcome to On the Origin of Battle Mix. My name is Brent Stewart McKee. I will be your host today. My co hosts are. I'm Joshua. I'm Jeff. Hello, I'm Connor. And today we're going to be talking about the Kyoto. It is a 45 ton guy, and it only has three variants, two of which are predominantly during the Star League era, and the third one made a reappearance during the Jihad. Yeah, I think after the Mackie, this is probably the most significant battle mech we've covered so far. To me, this is the birth of kind of the trooper mech. It's also a significant step toward faster and more agile mech, filling a support role on the battlefield as opposed to the hard point that the Mackie serves as. It's also interesting because in its design, it uses a lot of innovation and different designs because it had partial blueprints from the Mackie for what the team was working with and so they took their own liberties with how to solve the problems. Some of the design choices caused issues and were resolved in subsequent iterations and some of them were innovations and became standardized in other battle mechs. I think you can see a little bit of that with the armor plate on the right arm. The head also reminds me a lot of the uh, Centurion. You gotta think this is still, what, the third mech in the history of battle mechs? So it's still very much an iterative process and they're trying new things out. And for this one, they they didn't have as much to build on as they did with the previous Bellerophon because this company wasn't involved with the Mackie. The Mackie topped out at 50 kilometers an hour, 3.5 in hexes. This guy bumps it up to a whole 64 kilometers an hour. Still not fast, but on par with the more of the battle tanks of the period. It can keep up with your armed forces. This first prototype is very much a support mech with that large laser and an LRM-10. So one of the design choices that was not beneficial, as you can see if you look at its legs, actuators and pistons or shock absorbers not entirely sure what those are without looking at a blueprint they're exposed making it exceptionally susceptible to infantry attacks which was a design flaw in the d01 that would be removed in subsequent iterations according to the succession war tro those are the unique leg suspension and leg actuator layout so it's what actually controls the feet and lower leg the the stuff you don't want shot the stuff that should not be on the outside no but one innovation that was positive was the moimer actuator connectors they innovated better system using stem bolts that has been adopted by almost every manufacturer since then and results in easier maintenance better connections less wear and tear on the systems the internals were also reorganized from the way the Mackie was, making it easier for uh, maintenance crews to get into it in the field and perform their, their tasks in a quicker fashion. If we look at the technical readout and the drawing there, we can see that it has abandoned the curved armor plating for the much more standard flat plate, which can be cut into the necessary shape to fit onto the angular body. Yep, it's simpler and easier to produce rolled flat pieces than it is to cast curved pieces. This actually has hands, which is something I don't think we've seen before on, on mechs. I know the Mackie didn't have them. Kudo is a, the first battle mech to feature hand actuators. It just overall looks a, a far more streamlined design. Much sleeker. We're starting to see the, the final form of battle mechs evolve at this point. So this particular unit would remain in service until the end of the Reunification War, and it has a battle value of 748, which is reflected in the fact that it has primitive armor, primitive engine, and weaponry. It's not something you want to write home about. Or drive. And only having an LRM-10, it wouldn't have a significant pun. LRM-10, large laser. And the, and the large laser. It's more notable for the advancements made towards other mechs than what it actually contributes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The Kyoto 2, on the other hand, this one bumps up to 5.8, so 86 kilometers an hour, and still has a large laser, but it, now it's an extended range large laser and an LRM-20. With Artemis. 
again, 45 tons. I still think of this as one of the earliest trooper kind of mechs. You can field it in larger numbers. It's fairly flexible. Definitely more mobile. It can fill that direct fire support role or that long range fire support role. The quintessential trooper mech is the Centurion. Similar loadout with an auto cannon, an LRM, and Centurion adds two medium lasers. So this guy is kind of that lighter weight. We're less expensive. We've got direct fire. We've got indirect fire. We are a trooper mech. You build up in large numbers and you just throw them out there. However, the Kudo is so early in that development, it never really got a chance to shine in that kind of trooper role as more modern equipment came online. I mean, there is 200 years difference between the, the, the one and the two variant though too. So there is, there is a fair bit of time there. Yeah, about 200 years. The KY-2D-02 was produced after the Reunification War, introduced in 2625. It also introduced those leg upgrades I talked about earlier, which made it less susceptible to infantry attacks, reinforcing its role and making it a much more reliable weapon. Sadly, Martinson would disappear in a fireball at the beginning of the Amaris coup. The Kudo disappears from history about 100 years after the second variant comes online. Doesn't come back online until the Jihad, when there was such a shortage that people were pulling out any historical design they thought they could upgrade and build to throw into the, the furnace. Of note, though, while this wasn't uh, prolific on the battlefield, it did serve in the Davian War of Succession on the Star League Defense Force side that interceded to de-escalate the war with the point of a sword. And so it did see some frontline action, at least for a brief time. And the battle value of this guy is 1286. And then, like I mentioned, Kyoto was resurrected to fill the, the need for battle mechs. KYD-03 replaced the LRM-20 with two multi-missile launcher 7s, MML-7s, both with Artemis IV fire control. This is where the Kudo really comes into its own as a solid trooper mech, because now it's got LRMs out of the MML launcher, basically an LRM-15. It's got SRMs out of that MML, basically an SRM-14, which is terrifying, and then it still has that ER large laser, which just it covers all the range brackets. It's fast, it's still 5'8", it's decently armored. I had talked about maybe we should come up with a modern variant for the Kyoto, but I don't think you can get better than the O3 for, for its role. It's just an amazingly solid little mech. The one issue I see with it is the fact that it only has two tons of ammunition. You're probably only going to be taking about one ton of each. So you might be a little light on shots, depending on how long you're going to last in the battle. Yeah, if you're trying to fill that trooper role, then theoretically you're on the front line. You can rotate back for resupply as needed. You're not some sort of guerrilla fighter behind the enemy lines, long-range flanker type thing where you need that extended ammunition. But you're right, it is it is definite disadvantage. That is the only issue I can personally think of of this mech. I like what it does other than the fact that you know re resupply would be an issue and on the battlefield you're not going to have an overwhelming amount of ammunition between the short range missiles and long range missiles for those MMLs. Other than that, it, I think it's a fantastic little mech. It's more of a blitz unit or a shock unit than a sustained battle unit. And to be fair, with the way classic Battletech plays, one ton of SRM and one, one ton of LRM are going to last you pretty much any conceivable game on the tabletop. It really will. This, this is more me trying to play devil's advocate and have something negative to say about it. <laughs> yeah, because right, we're, we're talking, what, 20 LRM shots and 15... 17 and 14. 17 and 14, yeah. Now, the 17 and 14 are split between the two launchers, so that's going to be eight and a half and seven shots, respectively, if you're opening up with both units. You've got basically 15 shots between the two missile launchers and the two ammo types. That's probably going to last you. It most definitely will. If you've got a game that goes beyond 15 rounds, you're probably playing Mega Mech rather than Classic Tabletop. Again, this is me trying to have something negative to say about it because we can't sit here and just blow smoke up the rear end of this thing all day. Well, I mean, you could bring up the launcher on the left arm, which just looks absolutely stapled on. It reminds me of the uh, weapons port on some of the Atlas builds that just stick out there. And when I was playing MechWarrior 4, that was a hot point that people targeted all the time. 
time. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely one of those kind of early 2000s, maybe mid 2000s box artwork where everything is just a box. And it has that nice sleek design, unlike some of the other designs we've talked about, which are rounder. It feels smooth and uh, like something that feels contemporary to me. See, I, I have to disagree. It, to me, it feels very sharp and pointy. Like you walk too close to that thing and you're going to give yourself a paper cut on one of those edges. I don't mind a little roundness in mech designs, just as long as it's not full-blown 1980s curves. I would like to see a more modern take on this with the kind of mech warrior online, game of armored combat, kind of blending of curves and straight edges so what was the davian succession war that this thing fought in that's part of the deep backstory you're looking at the original source books to find information about that that conflict goes by three names it goes by hidden war the war of davian succession and the first council war many people in the universe consider it to be the first death knell of the star league due to the inaction of first lord so War of Davian Succession is based around the fact that first daughter of the then first prince, Roger Davian, Mary Davian, as part of her diplomatic training, went to Luthien on a diplomatic mission. And during her time there, she fell in love with Sato Karita, who was the fifth born child of the then coordinator, Urzene Karita. They fell in love and got married, which provided a bit of a succession problem, particularly with the fact that she stayed in the Combine and was raising her children in their tradition. So you can imagine how well that went over with the Davian court, especially when you think about the fact that in the previous generation, the court wasn't super happy about a female first prince with the Davian Holt line. So Prince Roger signs the Act of Succession in 2700, signing the succession to Joseph Davian over Mary and her children. Yes. Mary signed herself, but none of her children or Sato did. None of them pressed any claim until after Mary passed away in 2715, at which point the issue was brought to the First Council, where it was supported by forged documents claiming that Mary wanted her children to be next in line for succession, as was their rightful place. And Lord Cameron vacillated on the issue, not wanting to support one side for fear of the other side pulling out of the Star League, weakening its governmental legitimacy. As such, he commissioned an investigation into the matter, which was hindered and dragged its feet and after several years didn't result in any findings. As a result, at a council session when the issue was again pressed, they said that they were going to still look into the matter, but if Joseph Davian died before the issue was resolved, the ruling would default to his side's case. That, of course, didn't sit super well with the Combine because they wanted to press the claim, as is tradition, and so they invaded, heading towards New Avalon in an attempt to coronate Mary's son, Vincent. In an effort to rebuff the attack, Joseph launched a counter-invasion, hoping to cut off off the supply lines. Unfortunately, he found that the Combine border was more reinforced than was expected. And so the Combine and the Federated Sons ended up fighting into a stalemate, which resulted with the high point of Joseph being overwhelmed and being killed in action. Shortly after, the Star League Defense Force showed up to enforce a peace and reset the borders to pre-conflict border lines. One important note during this operation on the Star League Defense Forces side is that a young officer, Alexander Kerensky, saw some of his early combat there. So, you know, that's an important name. It also appears in the aftermath. Uh, First Lord Jonathan censored both sides, but directed the brunt of the condemnation towards the Draconis Combine. Yes, because while the Davians were in the right, they did not act correctly. And of course, that led to a lot of animosity being bred among the houses and between the Star League, especially after it was found out that the documents were forgeries, which is why lots of historians consider this to be the first cracks in the fall of the Star League. It definitely seems that this could have contributed to the 
Great House's refusal to aid the Star League during the Ameris Civil War, among other reasons. And of course, you're going to have these sorts of issues when you have a ruling body which is determined by a primogenitor. If anybody is unfamiliar with that sort of system, I would recommend they look into the CGP Grey videos on the subject, specifically how to become the British monarch and also the family tree of the British monarchy. They're fun, entertaining, and as inspiration for House Davian, it's not a terrible thing to be aware of if you're diving into the lore. That requires a little bit more intelligence than I claim to have. <laughs> Specifically about what? Primogenitor? Oh, oh no, the, the, the lines of succession when it comes to royalty, because especially if you go further back in history, because it just gets more and more confusing. It does, but there is always one rule that you have to understand and realize is the most important. Rule zero, bigger army politics. <laughs> The only notable mech warriors I can see where it comes to this mech is Captain Haddon. Captain Martin Haddon. So what, what that was a raid on the Iridian Battle Mech Unlimited Factory in Shiro 3? Yeah, so it looks like through his support to Andirian following the revelations concerning the Captain General's true identity. So this looks like it happened during the Jihad. Because, uh, spoiler alert, Thomas Merrick... The leader of the Free Worlds League is actually Thomas Hallis, the real Thomas Merrick's body double, and the real Thomas Merrick is part of Comstar, and he's the Word of Blake master. So when Thomas Hallis' true identity was revealed, that's when Captain Martin hadn't switched his support to Endurian, which means he was probably rocking a, a Kyoto 3. And just point of clarification, at that point, Comstar and Word of Blake were separate entities. Yes. Because we'll get letters. He would have been driving that Kyoto 03 with two MML 7s rather than the, the Kyoto 2, which, which is the entry in 3075, TRO 3075. I don't think we did battle values or point values for them. So the uh, the primitive Kyoto, the large laser, and the LRM 10, and all the primitive tech has a battle value of 748, a point value of 21. The Kyoto 02 has a battle value of 1286 and an alpha strike point value of 35. The Kyoto 03 has a battle value of 1167 and an alpha strike point value of 35. Uh, the Kyoto 3 is the only one that's available during the Jihad and after. The Kyoto 2 is extinct after the first and second succession. And of course, the Kyoto 1 is extinct after the Star League is founded. Our sources for this episode are Experimental Tech Readout Volume 1, 3075 Unabridged Age of War Technical Readouts and Record Cheats, Sarna, and Master Unit List. Shoutouts are Sarna, Master Unit List, and WolfNet Community, as always. We are supported by our Patreons at patreon.com backslash on the origin of battle mechs. Our social media on Twitter is at origin of mechs. We also have a dedicated channel on the Everything Battletech Discord. Feel free to stop by and say hi. If you have any questions, requests for topics, or wish to contact us, our email is on the origin of battle mechs at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, I encourage you to let your friends know about us and to leave a review. Special thanks to my friend Laura for the intro and outro. Hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Peace out, my warriors. Make it a great one. Catch you later. Module complete. System standby. Would you like to load the next module?